Um, good evening once again. Welcome to today's CME and thank you for your patience, even as we waited for those who are late to log in. Um, my name is uh, Dr. Idza Kalu, and today I'll be welcoming Dr. Nanda Saba, uh, consultant ophthalmologist, who are currently stationed at Kenyatta National Hospital, who is going to moderate our, our session for today and also welcome today's presenter. Um, Dr. Nanda Saba, Karibu. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Agnes. Sorry, I'm having a bit of a challenge with my video. I'll sort that out. But Karibu Nisana, everyone, to today's CME. Uh, before we start, I'd like to bring to your attention two very important uh, announcements. Remember, we still have our OSK conference that is going to take place at the end of November. That is on the 26th and 27th of November. Please remember to continue uh, paying for registering uh, for the conference. Then also uh, continue submitting your abstracts for the registration. It's ongoing until the end of this month, that is the 31st of October. Okay, now moving on to today's topic. We are very, very privileged uh, to listen to our very own pediatric ophthalmologist, that is Dr. Sarah Stati Makasi who's trained uh, at the University of Nairobi, both for her undergraduate and postgraduate uh, level. And she did her fellowship in pediatric ophthalmology in the US for a duration of one year. Today, she takes us through a very important topic that I feel is long overdue. And uh, I think it's a good thing that we have a privilege to listen to it today. And it's on management of pediatric ocular trauma. Um, during the presentation, if you have any questions, please remember to type in them in in the chat box and we'll tackle them at the end. If you have a pressing comment, you can raise your hand during the session and we'll slot you in. So for now, uh, we welcome Dr. Sarah Sitati, Karibu Sana. Dr. Sitati? Uh, sorry, can I run here, Dr. Sitati? No, not yet. Okay. Uh, Dr. Sitati, please check if you are muted. Sorry, I was still muted. I have greeted everyone and I uh, even started with some preliminaries and nobody can hear me. But... <laughs> 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 Continue. <laughs> yes, uh, as I was saying, I'm, I'm also having problems with my video, but luckily I do not have any issues with my screen share, and so we can be able to share this presentation. I try to log in to, with two devices, but I think I'll just leave it at this and we can continue. So my presentation today is on the management of pediatric ocular trauma. I think it's a significant topic for all of us because where, wherever you are, you have to deal with uh, children with eye trauma. And um, sometimes we just need a reminder of some of the points or we learn something new. There's always something new to learn uh, about managing children with, with eye trauma. So I hope that this will be, this will be a, useful in, uh, a useful presentation to most of you. And if you have any questions, please proceed to put them in the chat. Yeah. So when we look at pediatric ocular trauma, I usually compare sometimes pediatric ophthalmology to veterinary medicine because, and it's more so the case when it comes to pediatric eye trauma because you are dealing with a very difficult situation and not inf much information apart from the one that you have to collect by yourself. 
the challenges that we have in this kind of scenarios are that parents are always anxious. It's a, always a highly emotive situation. Parents are always very anxious as to the, 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 the situation, the future of their child's vision. The child is usually in pain and unwilling to be examined. The history also may be a bit unclear. Sometimes the children are nonverbal and cannot uh, give a proper history of what the circumstances around the injury were. But apart from that, there's also a lot of avoidance. Children appear at home, they've been injured, and nobody wants to say what happened to them. Uh, there's a lot of blame game, usually, in, the, in this kind of scenarios. Legal action is often threatened uh, and stuff like that. So basically, it's a highly emotional scenario. And then to add to that, you're the doctor. You're also anxious. Maybe you're not used to dealing with children. This is a child refusing to be examined. And nobody has information that can give you or useful information. So you can understand how everyone is just on edge at this point when the child is coming into the hospital. So despite that, you have to go ahead and try and determine what is the history and try to, to see what information you can garner from this patient before you can proceed to the management. When we look at the etiology of, uh, of, of pediatric eye trauma in Kenya, over 50% are caused by sticks. We have, we did a study in Sabatia, which showed us this, uh, in as much as it was a rural setting, we thought that this could have influenced, but Muraidi et al. also did a study in an urban setting in KNH, and over 35% of the injuries were caused by sticks. So please, if you see children carrying around sticks, yeah. <laughs> yes, I'm the evil woman who grabs them and throws them away, yeah, but because this, this is our reality here. Apart from sticks, uh, metallic objects come in a close second, Knives, nails, wires, especially nails, they're usually hammering nails or playing with wires, yeah? And this also are an important cause of injury. Then stones, another important cause, and then other causes. With others, with children, it's unpredictable, from pencils to toothpicks, mabatis, fists and elbows when they accidentally uh, injure each other, household tools. And the, the most interesting one that I have ever seen is a, one who was pecked by a chicken. This is a bad beak injury. So when you think about sticks and you just think about any scenario in the village or in town, children love playing with sticks. Number one, they love playing with them. Number two, they are a major, they're in the center of household chores and uh, household activities. Sticks are being used for firewood, they're being used to graze animals, they're being used to play. And so sticks are just readily available everywhere. And so it is no surprise that over half of our injuries are being caused by sticks. Bad big injuries, as you can see in this picture, are usually in toddlers. So this between the age of one to three years, uh, when they are trying to play with chickens, you can see the level of that chicken. If it just jumps a little bit eh, and attacks the child, yeah, or tries to, yeah, tries to attack the child, then the child is almost at eye level with the, with the, with the chicken. And so that's how bad big injuries uh, occur. Then other interesting ones, this is a child who came with a, pencil, it's called a what, a pencil beak, the nib, pencil nib in the eye. It looks whitish because it has been covered by fibrin, but actually was poked in the eye by, with a pencil by another child in class during play. And so you find some interesting etiologies like this one's also coming to you in the, in the, in the casualty. When we look at the epidemiology, uh, there is a high, high male preponderance, not only in pediatric eye injuries, but I think in all trauma. <laughs> 
there's a high male preponderance in all trauma in adults and in children. Yeah. The reason that there's a male preponderance in, uh, in pediatric eye trauma is that generally boys are more aggressive at play and they have more risky play than girls. And so you find that almost all studies, this is consistent that the male preponderance is uh, usually around 70%, approaching 70%. The age specific pattern, six to 10 years is an age where they are injured a lot. And if you look at that, apart from the aggressive uh, play, they're also exposed to different areas of play within the environment. So from the playground to the home, these are very, this is a highly active age group. And so you find most of the injuries uh, falling here. The other reason is that below five years, they're usually, usually under close watch of the parents, yeah? A baby of uh, one year, the mother will not let them be away for too long before she starts to find out what is going on. And so you find that most of their play is supervised. But once they reach six years, then some freedom is allowed for them to go out and play with others. And that is why they get injured a lot in this age group. Children's eye injuries are largely accidental. Actually, over 99% are usually accidental and caused by other children. Over half of them are caused by other children. If we look at this person causing injury here, this is from uh, the audit that we did at Sabatia. We found that over half of pediatric eye injuries were caused by other children. And then these were closely followed by self-inflicted injuries. So if you take history, you'll find that usually other children were involved or the injury was self-inflicted during play. Of course, we have to have a group here where they don't know what happened uh, as the history may be unclear. So this group will always exist when you're dealing with children and others, yeah? For example, uh, injuries caused by adults, a small, maybe around one to 2%. These are usually in teenage children. When we're talking about children here, we are going to from zero to 15 years. So these are usually in teenage children, especially in high school. And I think these injuries that were represented here were caused by uh, teachers during caning, yeah. So hopefully uh, because caning is now uh, not allowed in school, uh, this will. This is something that will be a thing of the past. When we go to the place of injury, uh, majority of injuries happen at home. You know, uh, first home and then school. So, as we said, injury in children is a usually highly emotive scenario and especially when children are injured in school yeah parents are usually extremely agitated and extremely angry but i think uh, at some point we should give <laughs> we should we should give the school some uh, not some credit but we should know that this injury was in fact five times more likely to have occurred at home than it was to have occurred in school uh, injuries at home occur in our setting largely because of unsupervised play. Children are often left by, the other, uh, by themselves or taken care of by older children. And so you find that children uh, with children, they, with no adults watching or supervising, injuries are, are very likely to occur. In school, these are usually occurring during school activities in the playground mostly. So most injuries will happen in the playground or during sports activities. That's when you'll find uh, the school injuries occurring. Of course, there's always yeah, that group where uh, you do not know yeah, what happened or where the injury happened. But these ones where they don't know are usually, they're usually at home the children stray off with older children and then they come back with an injury. And so it is unclear where exactly the injury occurred. Uh, anywhere where children are playing, 
I think can be a place of injury. Yeah. So we can see church here and just basically anywhere where where the, the, the kids have an opportunity to play. So when we look at the classification, of course, there's a very detailed classification, but I'll stick to the basic one where we generally classify uh, these eye injuries into blunt injury or penetrating injuries. This picture is familiar to most of us, and it shows us basically uh, what happens during blunt injury and everything that can go wrong here. Yeah? I think the only thing miss both penetrating and blunt injury, the only thing missing here would be perforations, which would be uh, cornea perforations and sclera perforations. But everything else can, can, can happen with both penetrating and with blunt trauma. Yeah, from ruptures of the sclera and cornea to tears in the iris causing high femurs, cataracts, uh, which can either the capsule intact or not. You can have vitreous hemorrhages here, retinal detachments, choroidal bleeds, uh, edema of the retina, which we call Berlin's edema. So basically, there's a lot to cover in terms of trauma, but I'm going to narrow this presentation to talking about uh, penetrating injuries because those are the ones that we see more. I think when we look at uh, Muraidi et al. study, penetrating injuries accounted for 70% of all the eye injuries. The Sabatia study only looked at penetrating injuries so did not compare with blunt injuries. To we'll go through penetrating injuries and then a little bit about. So the first thing, what happens when this child is presented to you? Of course, we've talked about the challenges that you have in the, in the A and E. History, it may be a witnessed trauma. Just take as much history as possible. Uh, whatever is, uh, is, is given to you by the guardian or the parent, yeah, record it, record it down. The important thing is you have to take the, uh, when we say in trauma, you have to take the when, the where, and the who. So when did the injury occur? Uh, where did it occur? And who caused the injury? Yeah. So those three things must be included in your history. So this is a seven-year-old girl who was injured three days ago at home while playing by, uh, by herself while hammering a nail. So the other thing that we add to the when, where, and who is the circumstances around the injury. It is important to note this, uh, to record the circumstances around the injury because with children, as we said, people often threaten litigation. And so the history has to be clear in case uh, the, the file or the record has to be pulled up later to ascertain uh, compensation or things like that. So the other thing is that children often do not want to be examined, yeah? So no, no forceful examination. Uh, it is okay just to determine is this a penetrating or a blunt injury, yeah? If you find that it is very uh, uncomfortable for the child, uh, just plan for EUA so that you can get proper details of the extent of the injury. I think what we usually say is what if I admit a child who is not supposed to be admitted? If you're not sure, admit, okay? If you're not sure, admit and take the child for EUA so that you can get proper details of the extent of injury. Visual acuity is not always possible in this, uh, in this age group. Uh, whether or not you can take the vision depends on the age of the child and also of the on the cooperation of the child. Remember, even if it's a 10-year-old, maybe they are, yes, they can read, but they are badly injured, their eyes tearing, they're in pain, and they're not willing to take, uh, to, take uh, to, to, to read your e-chat, yeah, your Snellens chat. So it is okay if you're not able to, to take the visual acuity at the first presentation. Uh, this is common in children, 
But if you're able to do vision, then go ahead and take the vision because one of the things that actually helps us to determine prognosis is the, is the, is the presenting visual acuity. So over 70% of children after injury present to a health facility within 12 hours. The challenge that we have is that the health facility is not usually the treating facility. These uh, parents usually present to the health center or the sub-county uh, hospital or somewhere where they do not have an ophthalmologist. And usually the only thing that they can do at that facility is to pad the eye and refer the child to the treating facility. Most children will arrive uh, at the treating facility between one to three days, okay? Uh, we always say we don't do eye drops at all, no TO. I know for ophthalmologists, this is obvious, but out there, this is a point that you have to emphasize if you talk to your healthcare workers in the periphery. Uh, they love TEO a lot. It seems to be the Mwarubaine of, of eye care. So no TEO, yeah, no eye drops, just pad and refer. The thing that you can do is to give tetanus toxoid injection, systemic antibiotics, and pain control. These are very important, yeah. So I'll just go through some of the some of the 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 the, the some uh, some some actual cases yeah that i have seen or have come through or some of us have seen i've i've received some photos from some of other uh, some of us who are in this uh, who are attending this meeting as well which show the things that we are dealing with when it comes to to trauma in children on the is this the right or the left on the left Yes, you can see this eye here. This is a child who had a penetrating eye injury. And as you can see, they took a while to come to the hospital. How can you tell? The corneal scar, the corneal uh, perforation was extending from somewhere here, uh, going to the edge of the limbus at around, at around uh, eight o'clock. But part of it has already sealed and formed a scar, yeah? So about a third of the perforation has self-sealed and then leaving the uvea uh, exposed in the two thirds of the perforation. At this point, it is difficult to know what is the state of the lens because even if it was ruptured at this point, you find that the lens that you can see is clear, but only after you open up this eye and, uh, and check what is going on with that uvea, then you will be able to tell what is going on with the lens. With children, they, they, some of them tend to do this. You find that when they have delays to the hospital, some will come even after three weeks after trauma. So the perforation starts repairing itself. And then what happens is that if there was a ruptured lens, uh, the eye walls it off with a layer of fibrin, yeah? And just keeps the lens matter that was off, yeah? Keeps it together and then there's that uvea. So everything will sort of be attached together in this kind of child. The uvea, the cornea, and the lens matter that is in that area there, yeah? So this is an example of a child who had a late presentation. This on the right is an example of a child who had a severe injury, severe penetrating injury. And this actually is as globe rupture. You can find that, you can, you can see that there is a corneal perforation extending all the way. Uh, I think this picture might be inverted, but there's a perforation extending from limbus to limbus. Uh, from around 12 o'clock for the child who had everything extruded from the uvea, which you can see here. You can see the wound is dirty. Yeah, this is some 
pus around the wound. There are some blood clots here. You cannot see the rest of the cornea is very hazy. You cannot see what is happening behind here. But this is a child who had a severe injury. Actually, the retina was in the wound. The lens could not be located. So you find that you have some cases like this of severe trauma where actually what you go to do is do globe salvage. Tell the registrar not that you can and leave it there. Yeah, <laughs> it is better to have an eye that is not seeing than to have uh, than to have no no than to have no eye at all. If you have if you can repair this, you'll repair it definitely. This is an eye that will undergo thysis. But after that, you have at least uh, some volume where you can place a prosthesis uh, on the eye and then give the child protective glasses after that. Okay, some other cases of penetrating injury. This is a Y-shaped uh, perforation. Y-shaped perforations and horseshoe-shaped perforations are, I think, one of the most difficult kind of perforations to repair. This kind of perforation requires some thinking because corneal perforations, you always repair them perpendicular to the wound. And so you can see here, where is perpendicular? This, there are three directions yeah, in which you're supposed to, to fix this. but. Uh, I always say if you can oppose, uh, if this one was just touching the limbus but not involving the limbus, yeah. So what you can do with this kind of perforation, start with the center, yeah. Oppose two sides, two sides and two sides. So in the center here, you will have your sutures crossing. Yeah, sometimes they form something like a triangle if the perforation is neat or so, yeah? They form a sort of triangle in the center after which you extend uh, and suture the other uh, perforations going outwards uh, according to, yeah, you just pick a side end and, and suture them like that. So this is one of the more difficult corneal perforations to, to, to fix or to repair. Here, this is one that has already been repaired but uh, always check within your perforations for foreign bodies, especially when they say the etiology was a stone or a blast. Uh, boys, when they are playing, sometimes they, I don't know, sometimes they, they, they hammer things with stones jumping into the eye or they are, they are I, don't, I don't know how they explode things, but yeah, they do. And so you have to check your injuries very carefully for any foreign body. And if you have any foreign body, make sure that you remove it and document it. This is a child who had, uh, what you see, it's, it's, a, it's a horizontal perforation in the cornea, but it is S-shaped. This was an S-shaped perforation. And there was a stone uh, lying just beneath the cornea in the anterior chamber, which was extracted and, uh, and documented during the surgery. Okay, other penetrating injuries. Uh, this picture that we have on the left, yeah, the, this I usually say is a nice perforation because this usually is one that's not a very dirty wound. The eye is quite quiet despite the injury. We rarely see this, but when they come, at least we know they have at least some good prognosis for vision. The uvea here uh, is prolapsed into the wound. And however, the lens in this child was intact. And so uh, we just did the corneal repair and then, uh, and, then, and, then, and then left the rest of the tissues intact. These are children who will even come with some volume in the eye because the uvea has plugged the wound and the eye is relatively quiet. They come because the parent sees something black on the surface of the eye and after an injury, and that is why they present. On the right here, this is uh, another penetrating injury. Yeah, commonly what we see, uh, dirty wound infected, 
this will usually point to the etiology or the, the, the whatever caused the injury was a dirty object. So as you know, when children play outside, there are usually very few clean objects that you can find outside. So it's either contaminated with soil or with rust or with organisms that uh, you are not sure what they are. So this is a case where you can see there's a stromal abscess around the perforation here. And you can see that the wound itself is, has, has some pus within it. So for this kind of injury, uh, after you do the corneal repair, make sure that you give antibiotics. You can give intracameral or intravitreal antibiotics to help and, and take care of any further organisms which are in the eye. In these cases also, you must consider fungal etiologies and add an antifungal to your treatment. Okay, so what happens when it comes to surgical management? Uh, what do we do? This is a long, uh, a long topic. We cannot cover everything. So we'll just do a few cases and summarize uh, a few points which are important points in our surgical management. So of course the management depends on the type and extent of injury. Sometimes you may need to stage the surgery, okay? Not everything may, may be done at once. You have a corneal perforation, cataract, vitreous hemorrhage, you know, retinal detachment. So you can stage surgeries uh, according to the multiple injuries and deal with one thing after the other. For perforations, uh, these are cornea perforations. Usually we repair with an unabsorbable suture. Removal of sutures is done later under general anesthesia. For cataract and lens injuries, we do lens washout. For vitreous and retina injuries, they may require vitrectomy and retinal repair. All foreign bodies, uh, if you can access them, remove and document. Uh, some of them may be deeply embedded into the eye, like within the vitreous. So for this, we refer back to, to, to retina specialists who can either extract the foreign body or if it is an inert foreign body, which is not causing trouble, they can just, can just be followed up. But usually we, we, we remove all foreign bodies in the eye. Okay. Specifically, corneoscleral injuries. The first thing you do is EUA. So once the child is on the table under general anesthesia, this is the maximum opportunity that you have to examine the eye and determine the extent of injury. If you see any injury going till the, the limbus, you have to do peritomy and make sure that it is not extending into the sclera. So always do peritomy if you're not sure so that you can determine the extent of the injury. If there's any globe volume, begin with a paracentesis. This is important because that paracentesis will help you to, to insert visco, add some volume in the eye, and help you to manage, manage situations like reposition of the iris and things like this, yeah? So this is something that I was taught early in my career. Begin with a paracentesis and then move on now to to the rest of the surgery before you poke around the wound. Now you go to the wound, you need to clear the wound edges. A lot of our repairs take so long because our wound edges are not clear. There's discharge there, there's fibrin there, the iris is there, you know. So the best way to clear the wound edges is just use an untoothed forceps remove any discharge that you can. We use non-toothed forceps because you don't want to, to, to poke at things with a toothed forceps yeah, and cause bleeding or more damage to, to the eye. So use a non-toothed forceps, peel, remove any pus that is on top of the wound and flush well, peel off the fibrin. Most of the time children with a uveal prolapse, they, they, it's covered by a layer of fibrin, yeah? So peel off the fibrin, use the non-tooth forceps to detach the iris from the wood edges completely. And then your paracentesis will help you so that you go through inside the eye and make sure the wound edges are free from iris. You make sure the iris is detached and actually coming in. Then, uh, sorry. 
Then for the, the cornea, we use non-absorbable sutures. 10 0 is the preferred suture. Why? Because you can bury this suture very easily. If you use 9 0, it forms big knots, and these are not always able to, you are not always able to bury them. For the suture technique, you can use the 311 technique or use a slip knot. A slip knot is good because it forms a small knot. And also you can adjust the tightness of the, of the, of the suture before you uh, before you put you do the final knot which actually locks it. Do not be in a hurry. Yeah. I always say take two bites for good apposition. Do one bite one edge of the wound and then do another bite on the other side. Most of us always try to take one big bite with that small 10 zero needle which of course uh, usually doesn't work well. So we have to go back and repeat the sutures again. So if you want good apposition, take two bites and uh, when you're suturing. For the limbus, we use 9-0 nylon. Bury this on the cornea side, okay? So that when it comes to removal of sutures, you're not going to dig up the conjunctiva, dig up the sclera so that you can find your knot and pull out the, pull out the suture. So try and bury this on the cornea side. For the sclera, we use absorbable sutures, uh, seven or eight zero is okay. And for the conjunctiva, if you have a scleral perforation, then you just use the same suture as the sclera, but the conjunctiva is very forgiving. You can even use, Five zero six zero vicryl on the conjunctiva, and um, as long as you do self-bearing sutures, then then the conjunctiva uh, is, is is it will heal quite well. So let me just go through. This is a case that we had a few days ago. Uh, this is a patient who presented with a, a penetrating injury from a. A, a metallic object, no, a plastic object. He was hammering something and then a plastic object, I think a pipe uh, hit his eye. So when you look at the injury just at presentation, okay, you can see this was a dirty object by the matting of the eyelashes. There's some discharge uh, coming out there of the medial canthus. A closer look at the eye, you see the conjunctiva is quite injected. There's some hemorrhage there. And then this is the most obvious thing that the uvea is peeping out here at the limbus at around three o'clock. Then you can also see that there's a high femur uh, in the AC. The cornea is hazy. We would say maybe one plus haze. And uh, beyond that, the lens looks clear, but because this perforation is here in the corner, it is difficult to tell, would need to examine better under, an, under anesthesia. So we admitted this as a limbal perforation and planned for surgery. So on the table, this is the eye on the right. So we found that not only, so this is, has been partially repaired, so we find that, that, that there was actually a 10 millimeter uh, perforation extending from the limbus, about five millimeters of it was in the limbus, which is what we could see here. And then it was extending into the sclera for another five millimeters or so. And so first started with the, with the limbal repair. Limbal repairs are generally difficult to do. Uh, as you can see this, sutures are a little tight uh, because a position of uh, cornea and sclera, uh, these are two different tissues, yeah? And, 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 and with, a, with an anterior chamber that is shallow, you find that this is usually a challenge. However, here uh, we're able to oppose, I think with the, this is with the, with the, with a nylon suture, and then the sclera was repaired with a vicryl suture after that and uh, finally at the end of the surgery this is how it looked this is the, con the, the so you can see there's an air bubble in the ac it is always good after doing trauma surgeries to leave an air bubble 
it helps to tell you once your wound is airtight, then you can be comfortable and say, okay, we have achieved volume, let's get out of here. So your bubble should be nice and round. Of course, we can see this bubble is eccentric. It is sort of pushed to the edge by, by the perforation in this area, but the bubble is round. Uh, the lens in this case was spared surprisingly, and there was no injury to the lens, so it was left intact. You can appreciate here the part of the cornea which was sutured. Of course, the scleral part is, is, is covered by the conjunctiva. And then this is uh, the conjunctiva was closed with self-bearing sutures uh, and were able to discharge the patient home on the first post-operative day. So I just want to mention something brief about lens injuries because this often accompany penetrating or blunt trauma. Uh, we have two major scenarios. You can have a ruptured lens or you have a traumatic cataract. In a ruptured lens, the anterior, the capsule is not intact. The anterior capsule is not intact. There's cortical matter in the eye. This is an emergency. So after you do your corneal repair, you have to do a lens washout, okay? So for the lens washout, this can be done through a clear cornea incision or a scleral tunnel. For traumatic cataract, if you have an intact capsule, you can actually refer the patient. If you don't have a vitrector, you can refer the patient for lens washout and anterior vitrectomy and IOL, okay? If you have a traumatic cataract with a corneal perforation, repair the cornea, and refer for the lens washout. That is if your capsule is intact. If your capsule is not intact, you need to at least wash out the lens and then you can refer for a secondary IOL and anterior vitrectomy. In children, we prefer foldable IOLs, okay? This picture here is a child who was injured, I think in Isiolo and came many months later. So if you look at this eye, in the center, you have a, a cataract. He was actually referred with traumatic cataract. But here, there's also a corneal scar from a perforation that self-sealed. So intra-op, the iris was actually stuck to the, to the cornea here. This lens was initially ruptured at injury. However, it self-resorbed some of it, and then the rest of it just stuck together into a thick lens plate, which was around uh, around 2.5 to 2. Point, around two millimeters thick. So basically, in this kind of case, what we did is just we had to create a pupil. This kind of uh, lens plates are so thick that even the vitrector cannot be able to cut them nicely. So we had to uh, create a, a pupil here uh, with, with intraocular scissors and then place an IOL in the sulcus and then free the iris from this, from this wound. We did not touch the self-sealed part of the, of the perforation. We, we left the corneal scar like that, but freed the iris from, from that area. Other examples of lens injuries. This is a child who had a lens, ruptured lens. So if you look carefully, you can see that there's actually lens matter protruding out of there somewhere. And uh, it is coming into the anterior chamber. Most of the lens capsule looks intact, but part of it is flowing out. And so in this child, uh, we did a in this child, we did a lens washout, yeah, using a clear cornea incisions. So if you look nicely on the picture, you can see an incision here and here and here. So I would, when I make a clear cornea incision, I will usually put two paracentesis on opposite sides. This is because if I need to do anterior vitrectomy, so it makes it easier for me to do anterior vitrectomy at this point. So this is a child, this is after washing out the lens and clearing out the anterior capsule. And then thereafter, we're able to insert a foldable IOL and then do anterior vitrectomy uh, by using the anterior approach through the paracentesis. And finally, this is the eye after the, 
after the surgery was completed. Yeah, on the right. This is another scenario of a child who came with a corneal perforation and a cataract. You can see the cataract quite clearly here. And here you can see the uh, uh, corneal perforation with uh, uveal prolapse. So in this case, this case was managed as a staged procedure. So at the first sitting, what we did was repair the cornea, which you can see the cornea repaired here and the uvea was reposited, I think. From this picture here, you can see that the uvea is, is bleeding. Eh? There's, some, uh, blood, there's some blood on the uvea. So you always check for the viability of the uvea to check the iris, you check if it is bleeding or not. And if it is, it is viable, you can be able to reposit it. Most children actually, even when they come after a week, their uvea is still viable just because they form a nice fibrin layer which protects the uvea, you know, as they, as they come to the hospital. So once you peel off that fibrin layer, you find that underneath it actually the, the, uvea, is, uh, the uvea is viable. So here, the cornea was repaired with a 10-0 uh, nylon suture. And then you can see the three wounds here. This is a clear cornea incision made with a keratome. It's around uh, 2.8 millimeters. That is the keratome I usually prefer. And then two paracentesis on the sides, okay? So after doing the corneal repair through this clear cornea incision, the lens was washed out and uh, the patient was left a fake and uh, later on came for a secondary uh, IOL placement, which was done together with the removal of sutures, removal of sutures, secondary IOL placement and anterior vitrectomy at the next surgery. Okay, so the prognosis of this uh, injuries depends on the extent of injury. That's an important one. Uh, delay in treatment. So the, the, for the extent of injury, the worse the extent, the, the poorer the prognosis. Delays in treatment influence a lot the prognosis, yeah? Especially when you have injury with dirty objects. So the more you wait to treat it then, the worse it gets, yeah? And then the presenting visual acuity. So as we said, this may not always be able to, to, you may not always be able to take in children, but you can imagine if you're presenting visual acuities NPL, even in adults, yeah, what your prognosis is likely to be. Better prognosis with earlier treatment and for severe injuries, we just do globe salvage and counsel the, counsel the parents and the guardians appropriately for the same. In conclusion, uh, ocular trauma is a common cause of monocular blindness in children. Prevention is better, yeah? So supervised play, child proofing of our homes and play areas and keeping away of hazardous materials from children, these all help to reduce the uh, prevalence of, of ocular trauma in kids. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Sitati, for that wonderful presentation. It's been quite informative, and you're quite right concerning the issue of uh, injuries with sticks. I think uh, all of us, after a few calls, we develop a healthy phobia of seeing a child with a stick. So thank you so much for the teaching that you've given us. Um, just to go through now uh, some of the comments. We have one comment from Dr. Choksi. Uh, she's appreciated the presentation. And I think we are all in agreement. Thank you, Dr. Choksi, for that. There's a question from Dr. Godfrey Nyaga, and he's asking, uh, do you do biometry of the better eye as a guide for the intraocular lens power in case of a ruptured lens? OK. okay. Uh, thank you for those comments. Yes, Dr. Nyaga, so when you have uh, a ruptured lens, you find that when you're doing biometry, there are things which need to be constant for you to get a good reading. And so when you have a ruptured lens, those are interfered with. For example, you need a proper anterior chamber depth. Your anterior chamber depth is interfered with. 
uh, there's lens matter in the AC. So it is actually a very important question because this is a good guide. It is not the perfect scenario. There, of course, we cannot say two eyes are completely the same, yeah? But there's a difference. Uh, it is often a good guide to use the better eye to calculate the IOL power for an eye in which you are unable to do biometry. So these are eyes like, if you have a corneal perforation, of course, the surface of the cornea is, uh, is, is, is injured. When you have a ruptured lens, you're not able to get accurate readings, things like that. So using the other eye as a guide for IOL power for the, for the injured eye is actually a, a good way to go. Yeah, and um, and we should. It is better to do this actually than not to do biometry and approximate. The other thing that you can do in the case like with the ruptured lens, use the better eye. In the case where we have corneal perforations, where the surface is uh, the surface of of the cornea, of course, is interfered with. Then what you would do is that. Uh, you can do a staged procedure. So if you just do the corneal perforation and the lens washout and let, let the eye heal, then later on, depending on the position of the perforation, when the eye is quiet, you may be able to get a reading after that using the aphakic. Uh, you have to use the aphakic uh, setting on your biometry to calculate this. But don't place an ESGAN probe on a scar or on a perforation, or you know, if you have anything that interferes with it, go to the other eye and use that. Uh, Dr. Jeopard is asking, do you do cryo to sterile injury? If so, what uh, what's the limit beyond which you would do it? <laughs> Hmm. Dr. Jafaji is asking me a question now. He should help us answer. Uh, personally, I don't, I don't do cryo uh, at all for scleral injuries. What I usually do is just uh, primary repair. If I feel like further treatment is needed, then I would usually refer to retina to advise on this. But maybe Dr. Jafaji can tell us maybe in what scenarios do you do you do you do do you ever do cryo for scleral injuries and in what kind of circumstances i think that would be a good uh, a good a good question <laughs> back to dr jafaji <laughs> dr jafaji what's your comment on that uh hello rebecca how are you fine thank you doc how are you thank you very uh, very well very well Sitati, thank you for such a wonderful presentation. Uh, the, uh, the images you have uh, captured were very vivid and uh, uh, we've learned a lot. Now, uh, just a little bit on uh, the question which I posed, uh, usually anything beyond three millimeters, if you get a fresh injury with anything beyond three millimeters, uh, uh, I would do cryo. And I would give a time duration of about 48 hours or so. Uh, there is no study to tell you how many hours, how much time, but this is uh, something that I've come across. If you have an injury going beyond three millimeters, uh, then you're hitting anywhere beyond the pars plana plicata area and you're going to the retina. So you want to do cryo in that area to prevent a detachment from occurring. Uh, anything beyond that much time, uh, 24, 48 hours, then there's a good possibility that you're already developing a detachment in that area and the cryo may not work. However, if you can see, uh, if you can, uh, if, if, if you have a view of the retina, then I would encourage you to have a look at the retina and see in that area, depress a little bit and see. Uh, if the area is intact, you're good to go. If not intact, then uh, you'd want to treat it with cryo. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jafaji. Then um, I'll take one more uh, question and then uh, followed by Dr. Shabuya, she has her hands up. 
then probably I might bring the questions to a close so that we can uh, move on to the next part. So Vivian Nongore is asking, um, that she says that she's had an experience where the anterior chamber keeps collapsing while attempting to repair an extensively perforated cornea. So Dr. Sati, do you have any advice on how to handle this? Okay. Um, yeah, this is a this is a good question because we 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 get this a lot in our setup. So this kind of cornea, yeah, that is in this picture here. This kind of cornea is actually more common than we would like to meet, yeah. And what I do with this kind of ext ex extensive perforations, usually you find that when your AC is collapsing, usually you have something uh, trapped in the, in the wound. The first advice is to clear this wound completely until you can see edges nicely. Like you see the way it looks in this Y-shaped laceration. This is how it should look even before you touch it, okay? So the first thing is actually just to clear the wound edges completely. There should be nothing on that cornea. Use a repositor. If you find a, a, you clear the top part first and then you go uh, into the AC and actually do a sweep on both sides to make sure that none, no iris or no other tissue is attached to that wound. The second thing that I usually do in such extensive perforations is that I prefer to do a continuous suture. Most people are afraid of continuous sutures on the corneas. I don't, I don't know why, uh, but there's a technique where you, which you have to use to do it so that the, you're not buried at the beginning and at the end of it. So you have to do it the way you do self burying knots and you do, a, you do a, a continuous suture. So this helps me because by the time I am halfway here, I have already some volume on half, half of the eye, a little volume on half of the eye, which gives me confidence in, uh, in repairing the rest of the perforation. If you're going to do interrupted sutures, then st always start with this limbus and then the other limbus. Yeah, what I usually say is start always with the limbus on one edge, then the limbus on the other edge. Yeah, and then the other thing, come work from outwards inwards. So once you do the limbus, place a suture on this one next to this limbus, then on the other side next to the other limbus, on this limbus, on the other limbus, like that. So uh, you work your way from outside, outside in from both directions, yeah? By the time you're coming close to the center, you find that you have at least something is holding in the eye and you can get some, some volume and then that will help you. But in most of these cases, despite you getting volume and uh, fixing this cornea well and making sure there's an air bubble. Uh, the eye usually still undergoes stasis, and uh, and 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 you have to put a prosthesis, or of course, to to cover the to make the the eye at least for cosmetic reasons. Yeah. So, but those those things can help you at least when you're when you're doing the surgery in trauma. Okay, thank you, Dr. Chari. Then at this point, I'll, wel I'll welcome uh, Dr. Shabuya to make a comment or ask a question. Dr. Shabuya. Yeah, thank you for the good presentation. Um, my, my comment or my, what I've noted is in areas where we don't have foldable IOLs and because of poor social support, and of course, uh, a lot of county problems with referrals. Is there a chance of doing the rigid IOLs in these children? Is there any chance of doing rigid IOLs? Because the mother will definitely say, yeah, hata enda. And you are sure the, the mother will not go. My, my next observation is, uh, it's true that in some patients, there are some who have tried to put the rigid IOL and they come with a lot of fibrin, of course, because we don't have, you try the manual vitrectomy, it doesn't work. So what do you advise from your point of view? Okay, 
Uh, it is true that sometimes you're working under strenuous circumstances and you may not be able to get all the all the equipments or, uh, or, or or facilities that you need or consumables that you need to be able to 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 do what is recommended. Yeah. So for PMMA lenses, okay. As a rule, as I said, they are not advisable. And actually, what you said about fibrin <clears throat> is less of a concern than PCO. Our biggest problem with uh, with, with PMMA lenses. So for children where you can be able to do an uh, YAG laser capsulotomy later on in the clinic, children who can sit and accept a YAG laser procedure, okay? So in those patients, yeah, you can do your lens washout, do your PMMA lens, and, and then after that, when you have, you have to give them proper, uh, proper, proper steroid cover postoperatively. So give a two hourly steroid immediately postoperatively, and then taper this off to complete at least two months of eye drops. And then after that, if you give, if you uh, can, if when the PCO forms, you can do a, a posterior capsule. Uh, posterior capsulotomy using your YAG laser. Yeah, so you can do it if you have YAG laser, but stick to older children, yeah? For the younger children, unfortunately, they, you will have to refer eventually because that PCO you will, you will get, uh, it, will not, uh, it will not respond to YAG and uh, it will need vitrectomy. So at one point they will have to come anyway, yeah? But uh, you can do what you can for the older children. Okay, thank you, Dr. Sitati. Uh, we shall soon be wrapping up uh, in the next five minutes. Uh, before I let you go, I'll just take you back to the beginning of the presentation. You didn't mention um, the place of anxiety and uh, pediatric ocular trauma. And I'd like you to make a comment in terms of how we communicate with the parents in terms of the extent of injury and what to expect, because communication is powerful. And it does, unfortunately, it falls through um, uh, the different steps of management as you focus on treating the eye. So what's your experience and what's your advice on that? <laughs> mm. I think with communication, as doctors, we have all found ourselves in challenging situations where people are very anxious and we are trying to communicate something without increasing the anxiety of the patient. I think the important thing is to be realistic. Yeah. So you need to, to speak slowly and clearly. <laughs> yeah. Just tell them that, yes, this is an eye injury. The eye has, has, a, has, has, has a penetrating injury. It has given way. There are contents of the eye which are here and we have to go to theater to fix this eye. After that, then you wait from when, what you, you, tell, you need to explain to the parents that we will not be no, know the exact extent of this injury until we have done the surgery. So after that, I can be able to give you more details about whether this eye will see or not. However, from a preliminary examination, either it looks like it will not be so good or it looks like at least we will recover some vision. What you need to assure them is, what you need to tell them for sure is that you need to tell them that this eye will not have, may not have as good vision as the other eye. However, we will do our best to salvage whatever vision that we have. But in cases of extensive injuries, please just be realistic and tell the parent that However, we will do our best. And after we have done the surgery, then we will inform you about more about the state of the eye once we are able to look at it properly in theater. Then when you come to theater, so you start preparing them. So after postoperatively, you say, okay, we went to theater and this is what we found. Uh, things were not looking good. We put together the eye. 
it may not be able to see much, maybe just light or maybe, yeah, maybe just light, but the vision may not recover in that eye. However, we put together the eye, we're able to repair it and we will follow the patient, the child after this too, uh, to know where the final, the final, uh, what the final state of the eye is. Meanwhile, I would recommend that we use protective glasses to protect his good eye because this is what is helping him. Okay, yeah. So, I think you can do your counseling in a staged way, your communication in a staged way, and give information as it comes to you. Thank you for that. Uh, sorry to take you back in uh, 30 seconds. Please let us respond to Dr. Godi, who's uh, asking, uh, when do you decide to remove an eye in a child in the case of a severely damaged eye? Then uh, what's your comment on the issue of facial asymmetry due to an empty socket versus risking sympathetic ophthalmia? So very briefly, then I'll hand over the session back to Dr. Kalu. Okay. okay, if you follow me around in ward rounds, I usually, <laughs> I usually say, stop, don't eviscerate children's eyes, okay? Avoid evisceration as much as possible. Of course, at sometimes you have severe, very severe injuries. I think the only kind of eye that I've ever eviscerated is the one where the, co the, the cornea is maybe you have a limbal to limbal perforation of the cornea and then it extends to the sclera and you cannot see the posterior extent of the wound. At that point, your wound is there near the optic nerve. Yeah, By the time you, you're stitching and you cannot see what you have, you have to stitch anymore because it is too posterior. Yeah, Now that is the kind of eye where we say, okay, in as much as we may try to repair as much as possible, we may not be able to to achieve what we want to achieve. But parents always appreciate the fact that you tried to repair and did not remove the eye. They'd rather have an eye there that is not seeing than have no eye at all, okay? When it comes to the risk of sympathetic ophthalmia, this is something very unpredictable, but because sympathetic ophthalmia can happen two weeks after surgery, it can happen five years after surgery. How do we say that this eye is the one which will get sympathetic ophthalmia? So let us remove it, okay? We manage sympathetic ophthalmia as it presents, but intra-op, what we do is that we do the best that we can, yeah? Make sure there's no uvea exposed in that wound, yeah, and make sure that we repair the eye as well as we can. Because really, really for me, I think eviscerating children's eyes should be a no, complete no, yeah. Uh, unless your, your injury is ex completely extensive, there are some which you really cannot do anything, yeah, but we should, avoid eviscerating, removing children's eyes from trauma. Repair as much as you can and, and let the eye settle. Children surprise you with their healing process. Eh? Yeah. So even in eyes which are repaired well, you can still get sympathetic ophthalmia. It is difficult to predict and even how, when it presents is difficult to predict. So do the best you can for the child at the moment that you can <clears throat> and then we can manage other issues as, as they crop up, yeah. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Sitati. Evidently, this has been a very hot topic. Questions are still coming in quick and fast. So I just have submission in just 10 seconds. Very briefly, Dr. Masima is asking, <laughs> what is the best approach in carrying out ocular trauma? 10 seconds. This one I can answer quickly. The best approach is prospective do a prospective study, like what we did in Sabatia. I just noticed there were so many children coming with eye trauma. So I said, let's have a form, let's fill this, so that every child who comes with eye trauma put in a trauma form and fill this, all the admissions. And we did this, I think, over a period of about one and a half years, and we collected uh, data for over 100 children. Eh? So when you find you're in a center where they keep coming, yeah? start with having uh, something like a, a simple questionnaire, which takes in the details. But this will of course mean that you have to get consent from the parents and things like that. So 
for for the best way to do this is in a prospective way so that you can manage the situations when you do re retrospective you have missing data you have you know there are so many gaps here yeah, in these histories but when you do prospectively you can follow them and even ensure proper follow up yeah for your for your so that you can get enough data yeah Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Indeed, it's been a very, very worthwhile presentation. We have learned a lot, uh, as it has been captured by also our colleagues, Dr. Munene, Dr. Nganga, Dr. Mumani. They have expressed um, their sentiments on a very good presentation. So thank you all so much for coming today. Next week, there'll be another CME on Thursday. Uh, the time and the topic will be communicated. Thank you so much for attending. At this point in time, I'll hand you back to Dr. Agnes Kalu, who will close the meeting for us. Asante Nisana, and welcome again next week. Dr. Um, Kalu. Thank you, thank you, uh, Dr. Ananda Saba. Thank you, Dr. Sitati. That was a, an awesome, awesome presentation. Um, thank you everyone for attending and for being there and for asking questions and participating. Um, it's what helps us all learn and those who already know revise sort of. Um, before I close, I would also like to remind us there is um, the AOC conference coming up at the end of this month on, 20, on 29th. So please uh, plan to attend, it will be virtual and remember, register for the OSK annual uh, conference so that we can meet in, in Mombasa, learn more, discuss more, and even engage uh, socially um, after this period of, of social distancing uh, that, that COVID has brought. Um, thank you all. Uh, I have no other um, announcements, so I would like to wish you all a good evening and a good night and uh, enjoy the rest of your week please feel free to, to leave. Thank you.